So today we are going to continue our discussion of attention. And our topic is going to be um, various failures of attention. So just like we looked at uh, purported failures of the memory system in our discussion of seven sins of memory, uh, this time we're going to look at uh, various kinds of failures of our attentional system and why they occur. So we'll start by discussing um, neuropsychological disorders that result in uh, failures to pay attention. So we'll start with uh, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And then we'll talk about a disorder that should be familiar to all of you, uh, which is hemispatial neglect. And then finally, we'll talk about um, another phenomena that happens to uh, everyone, uh, even individuals who haven't sustained any sort of brain injury. Um, and that is something that, again, you should be somewhat familiar with from the Seven Sins of Memory article, and it's called Inattentional Blindness. And that's also going to be uh, the topic of your homework assignment this week is Inattentional Blindness. All right, so let's get right into it. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. So um, believe it or not, hyperactivity has been, uh, hyperactivity specifically in children, has been well documented since basically the 1700s. Uh, and it was formally adopted into the clinical literature in 1905. Um, and of course, in a contemporary context, it is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders um, that is outlined in the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So first, let's talk about general symptoms of ADHD. So there are different uh, subtypes of, of ADHD with different uh, emphases. Is that a word? Emphasis is plural, different things that are emphasized. Um, but there are symptoms that are common between the different subtypes. Um, so the first is, is fairly obvious, right? It's difficulty uh, concentrating or difficulty paying attention. Uh, another hallmark symptom is excessive activity or hyperactivity. Uh, there's also a lot of evidence that individuals with ADHD uh, have difficulty regulating emotion. Um, and the answer to that, uh, or as to why that occurs, will become obvious when we uh, look at neurological differences or differences in the brains of individuals without ADHD and individuals with ADHD. Um, but for now, just realize they have difficulty regulating emotions. Um, and individuals with ADHD, another hallmark symptom um, is that they often act impulsively or they have difficulty, um, they have difficulty with, with kind of what we talked about in the first lecture on attention, which is executive attention, right? So individuals with uh, ADHD have difficulty uh, stopping one response in favor of a more appropriate one, right? So they often act without regard to um, potential consequences or without thinking about um, all of the responses that might be uh, available uh, for that particular situation. Right? So we have difficulty paying attention or concentrating, hyperactivity or excessive activity, um, emotional regulation challenges, um, and also impulse, impulsivity or acting without regard to consequences. Okay. Um, and to be diagnosed with ADHD, as it is currently stipulated in the DSM-5, uh, these symptoms must appear uh, in individuals before they are 12 years old, right? So the vast majority of ADHD diagnoses are, do are still done in children. Um, and they must persist for at least six months. And lastly, and this is something that unifies all of the disorders in uh, the DSM-5, is these symptoms must um, uh, 
cause significant dysfunction or they must cause significant challenges in multiple situations or settings, right? So because of any of the symptoms outlined above, um, you're not, your child is not able to uh, properly function in a school setting, right? So they're constantly getting uh, notes home from their teacher um, about how they're not completing assignments or they're not following directions. Um, you're having a lot of maybe disciplinary issues at home uh, or difficulty getting them to uh, pay attention um, and follow basic directions. Um, and maybe this is also seen in, in um, during playtime. So maybe children are unable to uh, you know, follow directions um, outlined in a, a game they're trying to play or something like that, right? So in order for this to be considered a disorder, you can't just have those symptoms, but they must also be causing um, considerable difficulty for you in a number of settings. All right, so now let's talk about um, the potential causes of ADHD. Uh, and there are many different causes that uh, result in this disorder. Okay, the first is environment. And when I say environment, I'm referring to uh, the conditions of the womb. Um, so before individuals are actually born, um, the condition that uh, that their sort of fetal environment was, um, and also their environment during early childhood. Right, so we'll start with the womb. So um, having a mother who abused uh, drugs or alcohol uh, while they were pregnant with you uh, makes you more likely to develop ADHD. Uh, having a mother who was exposed to measles or rubella uh, while she was pregnant with you uh, would also make you uh, more likely to develop ADHD. Um, as would uh, anyone who has suffered trauma or abuse, uh, particularly early in life, is more likely to develop ADHD. Um, people with what are called central nervous system insults are also more likely to develop ADHD, right? So for example, ADHD occurs in 30% of individuals who have who have suffered um, some kind of traumatic brain injury, right? So that makes sense if you remember our discussion of uh, Phineas Gage, right? So when the the tamping rod went through his prefrontal cortex, he um, purportedly, by some accounts, um, developed difficulty managing his impulsivity, right? So it makes sense that depending on, on the nature of the traumatic brain injury, um, that individuals might develop symptoms of ADHD. Next, neurological symptoms. So how do the brains of individuals with ADHD differ from the brains of individuals without ADHD? Okay. Well, the predominant uh, disparity is that individuals with ADHD have a reduced or significantly smaller prefrontal cortex, which again makes sense when we think about um, the impulsivity issues, right? Um, all of the brain structures that are involved in the limbic system, right? So the amygdala, the hippocampus, um, are also significantly smaller in individuals with ADHD, which again makes sense that individuals would have difficulty with emotional regulation um, because the brain structures like the hippocampus and the amygdala are part of the limbic system, which is important for um, processing of emotion. Right? So individuals with ADHD have smaller brain structures like the PFC, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Um, they also have a smaller nucleus accumbens. So the nucleus accumbens is the reward center of the brain. So it's the area that gets activated whenever you're involved in any sort of pleasurable activity. Uh, that releases dopamine, so for example, sex, uh, drugs, even food can activate the nucleus accumbens. Um, so that is smaller in individuals with ADHD. 
Um, and so it makes sense that a lot of people with ADHD are more likely to develop clinical uh, um, clinical substance abuse disorders. So they're more likely to abuse um, drugs and alcohol, right? Um, because uh, drugs and alcohol both are, are uh, implicated in that reward system, right? So uh, particularly with cocaine and other um, illicit drugs, uh, you get a release of dopamine, which causes a pleasurable or euphoric uh, sensation. Right, so if that region is smaller, then you have to work a little bit harder to get that rewarding or pleasurable uh, sensation. Um, so relatedly, there are certain neurotransmitters that seem to be reduced, or there seems to be as uh, lower levels of certain types of neurotransmitters, um, most notably norepinephrine and dopamine, which again makes sense because these uh, neurotransmitters are involved in, in feelings of euphoria uh, and sort of those pleasurable, rewarding experiences. Um, but it should be noted that, and, and many psychologists and psychiatrists ascribe to the view that one of the reasons that individuals with ADHD uh, have less dopamine in their brain um, is because uh, one of the first lines of defense for ADHD, particularly severe ADHD, is the prescription of stimulants. Right? So stimulants are drugs that increase the amount of dopamine in the brain. Right? So if you've been on this stimulant drug for many, many years, your brain is going to compensate by making less dopamine right? because it knows that you're getting an influx of this neurotransmitter. Um, so it you know, sort of balances everything out accordingly. Okay? Um, so those are neurological uh, uh, manifestations of ADHD. Um, there's also a considerable genetic component associated with ADHD. Um, so for example, 75% of cases of ADHD seem to have some genetic or heritable component. Um, so much so that if your sibling has ADHD, you're four times more likely uh, than someone without a sibling with ADHD to develop the disorder yourself, right? So again, 75% um, of, ca of cases of ADHD um, seem to have some kind of genetic basis, and you're four times more likely to develop ADHD if you have a sibling with that disorder. Okay, lastly, um, this is the most uh, sort of complicated or least straightforward uh, theory as to some of the potential causes of ADHD. Um, and that's simply that it is a societal or psychosocial phenomenon, right? So what that means is, is it's basically the idea that ideas that are, excuse me, not ideas, um, the idea that behaviors that society deems to be aberrant, right? So behaviors that society deems to be unusual or abnormal or inappropriate are more likely to be featured in clinical diagnoses than behaviors that are accepted by society. Um, so one of the most compelling pieces of evidence that seems to support this societal view is the fact that uh, worldwide, uh, the youngest children in um, elementary school classes have been found uh, more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, right? So no matter what country or culture you're from, children who are younger than their classmates um, tend to be more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and they also appear to be given ADHD medications at nearly twice the rate of their peers, right? 
So what does this have to do with society or, or psychosocial implications? Right? Well, the idea is that maybe one of the reasons why these children are um, displaying uh, symptoms of ADHD and being diagnosed with ADHD is because they're simply lagging behind developmentally as compared to their peers. Right? But because we have this diagnosis, because we have this framework to, that allows us to label uh, aberrant behavior, we classify these children as such, uh, even though there's another explanation, which is simply that they are not at the same developmental stage um, as their older peers. Okay? All right, so that's uh, kind of a review of all of the potential causes of ADHD. Okay, so we've already talked about um, this particular disorder before, um, but I did want to just briefly review it for you guys. Um, so again, hemispatial neglect is a neuropsychological condition in which after damage to one hemisphere of the brain, right? So after damage to one hemisphere of the brain is sustained, a deficit in attention to an awareness of one uh, side or one field of vision is observed, right? So it's a neuropsychological condition in which after damage to one hemisphere of the brain is sustained, a deficit in attention to an awareness of one side of the field of vision is observed. Right? So the way that we define this or the way that it manifests is it's defined by the inability of a person to process and perceive stimuli on one side of the body or environment, provided that inability is not due to a lack of sensation, right, or a lack of vision. So the way this typically happens is an individual has a stroke. Um, usually it's a fairly severe stroke. And as a result of that stroke, they sustain damage to the right parietal lobe. And then following that damage to the right parietal lobe, they're no longer able to notice or attend to the left side of space, right? So I have some drawings here that you guys might remember. Um, and I've actually linked the video from um, the uh, Science of the Mind documentary that you guys watched in the beginning of the semester, just to remind you of the hemispatial neglect patient, uh, Peggy, right? So if you ask Peggy or someone with hemispatial neglect to draw a picture, like a clock, for example, um, they will only draw the left side of the clock, uh, the left side of the house, the left side of a flower, right? Even when you ask them to draw those items from memory, okay? Um, and also in very, very severe cases, when individuals with, um, one of the things that they noticed in individuals with hemispatial neglect um, is that they were always sort of complaining about being hungry or that there was a lot of difficulty um, in self-feeding. And one of the reasons why that is the case um, is because they only eat half of what's on their plate, right? Because they don't notice um, what's on the other half, okay? Um, so one other thing I wanted to add uh, is again, I want to emphasize that this disorder is damage to the radar system, right? It's damage to the attentional system. So it's not that their eyes can't receive stimulation or sensation uh, to create the images um, of the left side of space. It's simply because they don't notice it. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that in almost all cases, visual neglect is contralateral, okay? Which means that depending on which hemisphere you've damaged, right, 
then you're going to see a neglect of the opposite side. So like I said, most of the time people sustain damage to the right hemisphere um, and then have difficulty perceiving the left side of space. Um, and one of the reasons why that is, why it's usually the right hemisphere, um, is because if you damage the left hemisphere, there is actually representation in the brain on both the left and right hemisphere for perceiving the right side of space, right? So all of that is to say, if you damage the left hemisphere, you can still rely somewhat on your right hemisphere to help you perceive the right side of space. Whereas if you damage the right uh, hemisphere, um, your right hemisphere is the one responsible, solely responsible for the perception of the left side of space. But what you guys should remember is that it's almost always contralateral. So uh, whatever hemisphere you've damaged as a result of stroke or what have you, you're gonna have difficulty perceiving the, the opposite side of space, okay? So that is hemispatial neglect, which again should be a review for you guys. So now let's talk about this phenomenon of inattentional blindness, okay? So before we formally define it and talk about causes, I just wanna show you uh, some examples, right? So this was first documented in an experiment um, where they gave uh, participants this task, right? So they did many, many different trials like this, but basically what would happen is they would be seated in front of a computer screen and they would be asked to uh, look at what's called the fixation cross, right? So we've done this before in class, but basically the point of a fixation cross is to get people to look at an object or fix their gaze upon an object, right? So in any given trial, um, participants will be told to look at a fixation cross, and then while they're looking at the fixation cross, they would also be asked to uh, look on the uh, either the right or left hand side of the screen and um, answer a question. So basically the question they had to answer is whether or not when they see this, uh, this plus sign or this cross, whether one of the lines is longer than the other or they're equally equal in length, they're equivalent in length, right? So is one line longer than the other or not, right? So they would look at the fixation cross by itself and then they would see a cross on the other side of the screen and be asked to indicate whether one line is longer than the other or not. Uh, and then they would see a, a mask or the screen would be hidden and then they would start another trial, okay? So the critical manipulation in this experiment is that on some of the trials, they would completely change the shape of the fixation cross, right? So on some trials, it just stayed the, stayed the same, that little tiny plus sign. But on other trials, when they were looking at that cross and trying to decide if the lines were the same length or not, the fixation cross suddenly changed shape entirely. So it got changed into a diamond, right? And not only was it a diamond, it was a bright yellow diamond. <coughs> Excuse me. So what they would look at is whether or not participants noticed the change in the fixation uh, cross or not. And what they found is that overwhelmingly, uh, people failed to notice it, even when it was a bright yellow diamond, right? So if you gave people a warning and you said, by the way, sometimes, uh, this fixation cross is going to change shape, and we want you to indicate when you notice that change, almost 100%, so 90% of participants were able to detect that change. 
risk, but without some kind of warning beforehand, less than 10% of participants um, were able to notice that change, right? So it's again, a fairly obvious change that is very perceptible or very visible, but when engaged in this, in this presumably very easy task, um, participants were not able to notice it, okay? So that's our first demonstration of what's called inattentional blindness. And the next one is arguably the most famous demonstration of this phenomenon. Uh, so I, I linked this video here in the slides uh, and also uh, on uh, Canvas. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and pause the video uh, or pause the slides and go watch it really quick. Um, because this, this will make a lot more sense if you've seen the video. Um, and it would be kind of cool if you haven't seen it uh, to see if you respond in the same way that participants do. Okay. So um, this was, a, like I said, a very famous experiment conducted by uh, Simons and Chabri in 1999. So basically what these researchers did is they wanted to show that attention can affect perception within a dynamic scene. Okay, so they were looking at whether attention affects what you perceive during a dynamic scene. Okay, so what they did is they had uh, their participants observe a short film that showed two teams of three players each. One team dressed in white uh, was passing a basketball around and the other team dressed in uh, black shirts was guarding them uh, by following them around and putting their arms up uh, as you would see in a typical basketball game. Okay? And the participants were told to count the number of passes of the ball. So how many times uh, was the ball kind of passed back and forth? Um, so this task was designed to focus their attention on the team wearing white, okay? So they were focusing on the people in white t-shirts counting the passes. Here, let me put up the graphic there, right? So they count the passes from the players in the white t-shirts, okay? So after about 45 seconds, one of two events occurred either a woman carrying an umbrella or a person dressed in a gorilla suit walked through the game, right? And both the woman with the umbrella and the, the person in the gorilla suit not only walked through the game, uh, the gorilla also stood still for a moment and kind of beat their hands on their chest, right? So this is a very unexpected and again, very obvious, very visible, or very perceptible uh, event in the scene, okay? So again, after 45 seconds, a woman in a, with an umbrella or a person in a gorilla suit walked through the scene. Uh, and so what they were interested in is seeing how many people noticed the unexpected event or noticed the gorilla uh, after uh, after that. So after seeing the video, observers were asked whether they saw anything unusual happen or whether they saw anything other than the players. And very strikingly, nearly half of the observers, when they were showed this video, 46%, uh, so 46% of participants totally failed to notice that uh, there was a gorilla or a woman uh, in uh, um, holding an umbrella, right? So almost 50%, 46% of people totally failed to notice the gorilla or the woman with the umbrella. Okay, so strikingly, even when something happens right in front of you, right, a lot of times people have difficulty perceiving it or they fail to notice it. 
Okay, so again, when we formally define inattentional blindness, it's a failure to notice a fully visible, right, highly perceptible, very obvious, but unexpected object because attention was engaged on another task, event, or object, right? So in the preceding examples, people were very, very busy right? Their attentional resources were devoted to counting those passes or to kind of measuring the length of both of those lines. Um, and because of that, they failed to notice the unexpected object or the unexpected event. Um, so the particular theory uh, that psychologists uh, posit to explain this phenomenon is called perceptual load theory. And so perceptual load theory is kind of similar to the filter uh, models of attention that we've been talking about. Um, but it's basically the notion that our attentional system is a limited capacity system with a finite amount of cognitive resources available, right? So it's basically the notion that as cogni uh, cognitive or thinking beings, right, we have uh, a limited amount of processing power at any given time, right? If we think of our minds as computers, we have a limited amount of memory or RAM at any given time, right? So if we are engaging in a very demanding task, that requires a lot of processing power or a lot of memory, right? Um, then we are going to deplete uh, the limited pool of cognitive resources that we have. And because that limited pool becomes depleted, right? There's not enough processing power or cognitive resources left over for us to perceive um, unrelated stimuli in the environment, right? So we're devoting all of our cognitive resources to completing our task. So we don't have a lot left over to process or detect these unexpected objects or events in our environment, right? Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the general explanation as to why this particular failure uh, of attention uh, occurs, uh, why inattentional blindness occurs. Okay, so one final, um, one final experiment I want to show you uh, is related to inattentional blindness, but instead of looking at people's ability to uh, notice unexpected visual events, this particular experiment was looking at people's ability to perceive unexpected auditory events, or I guess they, they weren't unexpected, but, but they were unrelated to the particular task they were given. So in this particular experiment, uh, participants' task um, was what's called a visual search task. So basically, um, with a visual search task, um, they're required to visually scan a scene um, and find a particular object. So it's kind of like the, the Where's Waldo game, if you ever played that, um, if you ever played that as a kid. Um, so what they manipulated in this experiment was whether this visual search task was easy or difficult, right? Um, and while they were completing that visual search task, um, the particular event that they were asked about was a tone, okay? So as they were completing the visual search task, they were asked whether or not they could perceive just a simple auditory tone. Um, and what they found is that people who were completing the uh, more difficult visual search task um, were much less able to detect that auditory tone um, than individuals who were completing the easy visual search task. 
So this is interesting because again, instead of asking about visual events, um, or our ability to detect visual events, it's looking at our ability to uh, detect auditory events. But it's also interesting, I'm just gonna uh, go back one slide. Oh, maybe not. Um, it's also interesting because um, it seems to support the perceptual load theory, right? So perceptual load theory says that we have a finite number of resources available and that the more, uh, the more challenging or the more depleting of our resources um, our particular task is or the task that we are focusing our attention on is, right? Um, then the fewer resources we're going to have left over to detect unexpected events. Right. So again, we have a limited capacity attentional system with a finite number of, of cognitive resources available. So if our attention is focused on completing an especially difficult task, right, then we have less processing power available to simultaneously detect unexpected events, right? Whereas if we're completing a fairly easy task, that doesn't require a lot of cognitive resources, right? Then we're gonna have more processing power or more cognitive resources available to detect um, other events in our environment, whether they're auditory events or visual events, okay? So hopefully that made sense for you guys. Um, certainly, if not, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, this concludes our uh, lecture series on attention. Um, the only other lecture I'm going to upload is next week um, after you guys submit your homework for assignment um, and you read about inattentional blindness um, and so forth. I'll probably upload another lecture talking about um, driving distraction um, when one is using a cell phone. Uh, because that is the topic of one of your uh, one of your reading assignments. So I'll just review uh, that evidence for you. Um, but otherwise, all right, I will see you when we start our next module. All right, take care.